Thank you so much for coming. Fleeing from an abusive stepfather in El Salvador, Gabriela headed for Oakland, California, where her grandfather had promised to take her in. When the teenager reached the United States border in January of 2017, she was brought to a federally funded shelter in Texas. Initially, staff described her as receptive and resilient. But as she was shuttled from one Texas shelter to another, she became increasingly depressed. Without consulting her family, shelter staff have prescribed numerous medications for her, including two psychotropic drugs whose labels warn of increased suicidal behavior in adolescence, according to court documents. Still languishing in a shelter after 18 months, the 17-year-old doesn't want to take the medications, but she does anyway, because staff at one facility told her she wouldn't be released until she is considered psychologically sound. Um, this was taken out of a link from the daily, from our, our daily um, electronic newsletter, uh, citing a professor um, here, uh, Dean of the School of Law, Jessica Berg, on some uh, good information that was provided to inform this case and others. And so at the moment, this was about two months ago, and, and it occurred to some of us, you know, we're having Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations, and this is a very, very relevant topic. There's huge uh, knowledge and goodwill here in this community campus, and we just need to elevate it. So it really was not hard to find so many people to co-sponsor this event, to work together, to put it together, and these uh, wonderful panelists, experts, that have a lot to say and can give us ideas of how to act upon this information, keep us informed, and do something that might make a difference. So. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the uh, offices that are co-sponsoring this uh, panel, Childhood Trauma at the U.S. Border, uh, Alianza Latina, the Social Justice Institute, the Schubert Center for Child Studies, the Begun Center for Violence Prevention Research and Education, the Center on Trauma and Adversity, and the Center on Urban Poverty and Community Development, these last three centers here at the Mandel School. Thank you for hosting us in this beautiful um, space as well. I will introduce the moderator. I should say I work at the uh, Poverty Center, Francisca Richter. Um, and I will introduce the moderator and then let him uh, take us from there. So John Flores is Associate Professor of Immigration History and the co-director of the Social Justice Institute. Uh, Flores' research centers on recovering the lost history of Mexican immigrant political activism in the United States. His recent book, The Mexican Revolution in Chicago, Immigration Politics from the Early 20th Century to the Cold War, reveals the way Mexican immigrants created transnational political movements to improve their lives on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. John. Thank you. So, yeah, I think everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm gonna begin just by quickly, I wanna thank um, Dr. Francisco Garcia Coban Richter for taking the initiative to put this event together, to put an event together to talk about the horrific things that are taking place right now um, in immigrant families, among immigrant families across the border and across various parts of the United States. So I'm gonna begin by introducing each of our speakers and then we'll proceed into the panel and I'll start to your right to your left. So Dr. Jane Timmons Mitchell is the Senior Research Associate at the Begun Center, Associate Clinical Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry School of Medicine. While at University Hospitals of Cleveland, Timmons Mitchell directed clinics for children alleged to have been victims of physical and sexual abuse. In 10 years, the clinic saw over 11,000 children and youth. In 2018, she co-edited a volume entitled Suicide Prevention, a practical guide for the practitioner. Dr. Timmons Mitchell is a passionate child advocate who seeks to apply expertise to real world issues. Next is Professor Gabriela Sinkman the Director of Clinical Training for the Health and Wellness Program at the Centers for Families and Children. Sigmund is a PhD candidate at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. 
She has conducted mental health assessments with individuals who enter the US from Latin American countries, escaping family, gender, and social violence, child abuse and neglect, and political persecution. She offered a workshop for the Stark County School District on how to assist Latino youth immigrants in the midst of the 2014-15, quote, unaccompanied, end quote, crisis. We have Dr. Sana Lu, the Vice Dean of Faculty Development and Diversity School of Medicine and Professor in the Departments of Bioethics and Psychiatry. She has been following immigration law and policy for more than three decades, and she has authored numerous publications focused on health-related issues in the immigration context. She previously practiced immigration law, deportation defense, for more than a decade. Thank you all of you for uh, participating, and I think we're gonna begin with a question for uh, Professor Sana Liu, which is, what is the legal context under which family separation and child detention are operating? What is this legal context? So this actually, if we go back in history, this has been happening in U.S. immigration processes at least since the 1920s. So there are records, for instance, of parents uh, being deported to their countries of origin and being told, um, either take your children with you, even if they were U.S. citizens, or leave them here. And if they were left in the U.S., they were either given to relatives who may have been willing to take them in and care for them, or they became wards of the state. So there's a very long history of this. Um, certainly in the 70s and 80s, uh, there were lawsuits filed against what was then the Immigration and Naturalization Service because they would pick children up and essentially hold them as bait to try and get un their undocumented parents uh, to present themselves at immigration and then they would be processed for deportation. So it's, there's a very long history of this. Um, prior to 2006, some districts would house mothers and minor children together. Um, in many districts, though, the parents were separated from the children. Um, in 2006, Congress directed the Immigration Service to release families and use less restrictive alternatives to detention. So they said you could use appropriate detention facilities or you could release them to the community. But they didn't want them being detained together. Um, or separately in detention. What happened then was that <clears throat> the immigration, immigration and Customs Enforcement opened up a residential center in Texas. And that remained open for approximately three years until it was found to have been in violation of human rights. And then the Immigration um, Department of um, Homeland Security closed it. And they changed their plans and withdrew plans to build an additional um, three facilities. Um, in 2014, the government established makeshift detention facilities in New Mexico, which have also been alleged to be in violation of human rights. Um, but there's been this continuing practice of separating parents and children throughout this. In 1997, there was a settlement agreement known as the Flores Settlement Agreement, which has nothing to do with John. Um, but this was litigation that was initiated because of the way the um, immigration and the government was, was were treating um, unaccompanied minors. And these were kids who were under the age of 18 who were crossing the border by themselves. So they were coming without their parents, without any family, um, without an adult that could care for them. And there were numerous lawsuits filed against the government because of the way children were being um, essentially detained, sometimes indefinitely. And what that settlement agreement did was to establish national standards for the detention, release, and treatment of children um, when they were in custody. And it also set a standard for how long they could be detained in custody prior to being released. So the preference under this settlement agreement was that children be released to their parents. Um, but there was some leeway in terms of the time frame if immigration could establish that there was this huge influx that they couldn't deal with. They would not be released if it was deemed to be a risk to the child, if it was thought that they were going to be trafficked, or if the child was deemed to be a flight risk. So this is sort of the landscape that 
that existed prior to what is happening now. What is happening now is different in that if past processes had been followed, um, when children or families present at the border, now this is not inland because that's a different scenario, but when they present at the border and they're claiming asylum, they are supposed to be screened by an officer of um, Homeland Security, by a Border Patrol officer, for an initial screening to establish whether they have a fear of persecution um, based on, and that fear of persecution has to be based on uh, religion, national origin, uh, political opinion, membership in a particular social group. Um, if the child came across by themselves, the screening must also include an assessment as to whether they're capable of making their own decisions. Um, which may be true of older children, but is clearly not true of younger children. So that is what is supposed to happen. In general, if a family came across under the uh, demands of the 2006 demands of Congress, they are supposed to be released to the community or a less restrictive alternative to detention is found. What is happening now is that rather than allowing parents or children to apply for asylum, they are being separated at the border, which is not the process that had been happening since 2006. Um, they, the parents are being presented with forms to sign, which most of the time are in Spanish, and most of the time uh, the folks can't understand. They are being told what to sign. Um, so for instance, some of the first forms would have two choices, um, and the parents were, were asked to sign whether they wanted to go back to their country and leave the child in the United States, or whether they wanted to be deported with their child. Um, they were given no other choices, and in many circumstances, the Border Patrol officer had already checked the first one, that they wanted to go back to their country and leave their child in the United States. Um, people who refused to sign it uh, were told that they would never see their children again. So this has been, this is what has been alleged in, in court documents, and um, the most recent um, judgment that I've seen, the judge, um, said that these were accurate facts. Um, as of August 23rd, 2018, a total of 2,600 minor children had been separated from their parents. 366 parents who were separated from their children remain outside of the US, and 565 children remain in government custody. The government has argued in court that it's the responsibility of nonprofit organizations to reunite the children and find where the parents are after they were deported. Um, the courts have said this is not going to happen, that um, the government is solely responsible for the separation of the parents from the ch children, and they are to bear responsibility for it. Um, I think what many people don't know, and this I, I find really um, problematic, is the Department of Homeland Security, together with Health and Human Services, have proposed regulations that would result in the detention of children together with their families pending the outcome of immigration proceedings. Now, someone can be in detention for three or four years waiting to have their asylum claim heard. And during what these regulations would do is require that the children be detained with the parents during the pendency of those proceedings. Although the Flores Settlement set standards for the kinds of facilities that in which immigration can detain children, um, those standards have been repeatedly violated, and there are now actions in front of the courts challenging some of immigration's actions because of those alleged violations. So that's sort of the, the context. Well, actually, before I ask um, Professor Sinkman and Professor Timmons Mitchell to comment on this, um, actually, Sana, you and I discussed the way our current Attorney General uh, invoked the Bible um, to discuss to frame what was happening. Yeah. And do you mind, can you comment on that, this invoking of the Bible to legitimize, justify what's taking place here? Yeah, so um, the Attorney General Jeffrey Sessions claimed that um, 
there is a biblical injunction to follow the law and that this justified the government action because um, individuals who were entering the country were entering illegally and so the zero tolerance um, program was congruent with biblical injunctions. Um, in point of fact, if you go back and look at the historical context, um, when that um, injunction was, was um, uttered in the Bible, it pertained to a specific context and a specific situation. And there was also the underlying concept of justice, that the laws had to be just. Um, so I, I think Jeffrey Sessions is somewhat off the mark and is taking um, phrases out of context. Thank you. Um, Professor Timmons Mitchell, Professor Sinkman, would you like to comment on this question? Not at the moment. OK. Um, Professor Gabriela Sinkman, could you speak to um, what are the likely experiences of children prior to seeking refuge in the US? What are these experiences? How are they framing this process? Sure, sure. I, I just have to quickly clarify. I've been just bumped to professor. I'm not a, a professor per se, you know, formally. I, I do some teaching, but thank you for the uh, <laughs> recognition there. Um, so what I would like to do today is to bring to you the, the voices or the presence of these children um, and these adults who come to the United States um, to, uh, let me just go through this slide. They take on an extremely long, stressful, not to mention sometimes um, extremely dangerous journey to come here for safety. So I would like for you to understand the reality of, of these individuals who take on this risk. Um, a couple of things for you to keep in mind as I talk about their stories um, is that I'm speaking through my experience assessing youth and adults who emigrated from Central America to seek safety in the United States. So I, I hasten to say that this is my experience interacting with them. Um, the assessments were conducted while they were mostly going through immigration court trying to obtain legal status, as Sana was saying. Um, and while these experiences are certainly not representative of all Latino immigrants, how can they be, right? I, I do believe that they represent the socioeconomic reality of many Latin American countries, and they, they shed some light onto you know, to our understanding of why people uh, take such enormous risks. I will share four stories with you. Three belong to uh, Guatemalan youth, and one belongs to an adult from El Salvador. They illustrate the realities of countries uh, with terribly weakened states. You know, the, the authorities can barely provide guarantee basic rights, let alone provide services, um, education, safety, uh, law enforcement. Um, so the gangs, or maras as they're known locally, have filled this power vacuum and they have taken over. And you, you hear some, some stories that involve uh, local gangs. Some of the most common situations, I believe John mentioned this, um, the people that I have assessed fled from include family violence, societal violence, gender violence in all its forms, political persecution, uh, oftentimes on top of dire poverty, um, you know, living conditions. The, the last point before we get into the stories is that, you know, we're here to talk about the effects, uh, the psychological effects of trauma on the children detained and separated at the border. Um, but I want to, to encourage you to not forget that the, the ability that we have to engage in this exercise of thinking about trauma is something, a little bit of a luxury that we can engage in because we're not in a life-threatening situation, right? What has struck me time and time again when I interacted with, uh, particularly with youth, is that oftentimes they did not talk about trauma per se, right? Talk about sadness, they talk about the violence, the living conditions. Um, and that was particularly true for the subset of Guatemalan individuals of strong indigenous descent that I, um, that I interacted with. Uh, and many of these people uh, with Mayan roots barely spoke Spanish, so it was a, a struggle to, to communicate, but somehow we made it work. 
Um, so I'm not even sure that in their native dialects there is a correlate for the word trauma the way we understand it here in the United States. So keep that in mind. Um, many of them really didn't have anything to compare their lives with. That was it. That was life. That's all they knew. Um, and even so, in spite of being very young and having little to no formal education, they knew that uh, that life hurt too much or was going to get them killed soon. So that's why they, they took on uh, the trip. And I have the, the map behind me just to show you that from uh, the city of Guatemala to the Mexico-US border, you have to travel approximately 2,000 miles. So this, is, uh, this requires tremendous endurance. And um, you have to be really desperate to, to be willing to put yourself through that. So I would like to bring to you some of their stories. Um, the names, of course, I'm using are, are not real. They're not the, the names of the, the individuals. I will have to go into some detail so that you can get a flavor uh, of the circumstances that they, they experience. Um, so uh, I want you to know that some of the details may be disturbing. So get in your professional selves and get prepared to, to hear some, some of these stories. Uh, we'll start with Anna. She was a 17-year-old Guatemalan female who spoke the Mayan dialect of Ixil. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. There's some information for you about uh, Mayan peoples and their languages. She spoke Spanish at, as her second language. She came to the United States from a hamlet up in the mountains in rural Guatemala where she lived with her single mother and siblings. Um, and she, she told me that she really enjoyed going to school. But as she entered adolescence, uh, she started suffering harassment by older males on her way to and, and from school. Uh, I should add that there's no such a thing as a school bus. So the, the you know, traveling the, to, to and from school is long oftentimes and very dangerous. These males would follow her, try to fondle her, insist that she try drugs. The situation became so intolerable that her mom decided to withdraw her from school and keep her home for safety. And there went her chance at an education. Sadly, this, this um, safety didn't, didn't last too long as a group of males broke into the house one night while they were asleep and tried to rape her. Her mother heard the commotion and intervened to protect Anna, which she succeeded at, fortunately. But in the attempt, the mother was stabbed in her hand by one of the attackers. You might ask why, um, whether they reported the situation to the local authorities. And that's a fair question, but sadly, the answer is no. Uh, Anna shared with me that, for one, she could not see their faces because they had no electricity at the house. Uh, it was nighttime, therefore, she really could not see them. And she added that she was afraid of retaliation as she knew that there could be a connection with the local gangs. And plus, uh, she said that the police was entirely controlled by the local maras, the, the gangs. So they saw no point in reporting. The family then decided that Anna's best option was to come to the United States with another 17-year-old friend of hers. Uh, she was taken to a shelter at the time. This was a few years ago, uh, one of these shelters for unaccompanied minors that Sana described in Arizona. And eventually, she was released to a sponsor in Ohio while she was going through the immigration process. At the time, uh, she told me that while she was back at home, she had what sounded like PTSD type of symptoms. Um, but at the, at the time she, uh, that she had been in the United States, for the time she had been in the United States, she had uh, felt safe, stable. And even though I was probing and asking questions, at the moment she did not meet criteria for any mental health disorder. Um, so that's, that's one story. And then there's Antonio, a 17-year-old Guatemalan male. He spoke the Mayan dialect of Quiche and Spanish as a second language also. He came to the United States, escaping family and societal violence. He came from a large family of farmers in rural Guatemala who barely grew enough to sustain the family. He started working in the fields at age eight at the same time as he attended school. He endured severe abuse on the part of both parents, unfortunately. 
which included almost daily beatings with sticks, being kicked, threats that he would be stabbed to death or would be forced to drink wheat's killer. He and his siblings were often punished by being deprived of food and being made to sleep out in the open. School was no safe haven for Antonio. He was also harassed by local gangs uh, when he was uh, in school or leaving school on the way home. Um, so, I'm sorry, my pages got mixed up here. So one uh, afternoon as he was leaving school, he uh, was confronted by a group of the local uh, gang members and they viciously beat him, barely made it back home. And they told him that if he resisted to join them, he would get killed and his family would uh, be hurt. Um, he decided then that the only ch the chance he had to survive was to escape because you know, he had no safety at home or out in the community. And he decided to join his older sister, who was already in the United States. He reported to me that while in Guatemala, he lived in fear, um, that he experienced great sadness and what he called bad dreams. But however, uh, all that, she, he shared that once he was reunited with the sister, all of this seemed to uh, have resolved and he felt safe and had great goals of studying and you know, getting an education. And this is something that he cared for very, very much. And he also did not meet any criteria, remarkably, for any um, mental health diagnosis at the time. But then there was Glenda, a 17-year-old Guatemalan female who had escaped domestic violence and sexual violence. She recalled her childhood as good, However, her father saw no point in sending her to school as they only taught in the local dialect, not in Spanish, and the father thought this was rather useless. So they kept her home. She helped out with domestic chores, and that's how around age 14 she met the man who would become the father of her children. He presented like a nice guy, her family liked him, so they approved on uh, them moving out of the house together into this uh, person's um, house. But it hadn't been even a month that they had known each other, so they, off they go. A, a couple of months into the relationship, the typical cycle of abuse started. So it, it starts out with control, then escalates quickly to verbal, emotional, physical, all of that. Threats that she would get killed if she left the house or talked to anybody else. She was deprived of food. She was tied up and locked up in the house while he would leave the house for hours or even days. Somehow, Glenda managed to escape while she was pregnant with her first child. She ran back to her parents' home for safety, and uh, they took her in, and they thought the situation had quieted down. However, that wasn't the case. Um, the abuser attempted to intimidate them he started threatening with sending men to hurt uh, Glenda and her family. And one night, a group of three men forced their way in and attacked Glenda. They were obviously sent by her abuser. She was beaten, kicked, and raped by the three men. They were laughing, she recalled, and told her that her, quote, husband wanted her back and that they would continue hurting her or her family if she refused to go back. Glenda was left unconscious on the floor of the house after the attack. And she did not die thanks to her seven-year-old sister, who had witnessed the attack, unfortunately, but had managed to sneak out of the house and ran for help. Her family also considered filing a, a police report, but decided against it ultimately, stating that the nearest police station was too far and they had no way of getting there. And the client added, that the police officers, these were her words, don't take a woman's word seriously. At the time, Glenda had severe PTSD symptoms. She was deeply hopeless and, and presented with suicidal ideation. And finally, I would like to share with you uh, the story of Samuel. He was a 24-year-old male from El Salvador who had come to the United States escaping societal violence. He had been exposed to violence since childhood, growing up in what he called one of the most dangerous neighborhoods of the greater San Salvador area. 
Samuel had, had two brothers who had been recruited by local gangs, which unfortunately left the family in the crossfire between rival gangs. He was around 11 or 12 when he witnessed an older brother who was not involved in gang activity gunned down in an act of revenge. At 15, he saw another friend of his get shot and killed. At 18, while he was working as a bus driver, he suffered a direct, a direct attack. The, the bus he was driving was shot. He somehow managed to escape unharmed, but this really decided him to come to the United States seeking safety. Um, he, at the time, uh, he, he talked to me about his um, long struggles with various um, mental health symptoms that he had uh, suffered over the years. And at the time, he also met criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder and a depressive disorder. So um, these are some stories that, even though are very sad, also speak to the, the, the sheer resiliency that, that these individuals have. And um, I hope that they bring some, some, some context and some um, way in which you can relate to the issue on a more personal level. Thank you. Could I interject something? Um, so in the past, um, the kinds of cases that um, you were speaking of, in the courts have, immigration courts have ruled that um, individuals who suffer violence as a member of a group and who suffer violence either um, because of government action or due to um, actions of groups that the governments are either unwilling or unable to control, if that persecution is based on race, religion, national origin, gender, a political opinion, are potentially eligible for asylum in this country. So the kinds of individuals that you were talking about would potentially, in the past, have had a viable claim for asylum and to remain here. Under the recent pronouncement by Trump and Jeff Sessions, they are now saying that they are telling immigration judges that they can no longer consider that as a basis for um, family violence, as a basis for asylum. Um, although courts in the past have upheld that where the family, for instance, where the, person, the government would not protect individuals from the family. So there is court precedent for, for instance, for abused women um, being awarded, as, being give, granted their asylum claims on that basis, and children who were abused children being granted asylum on that basis. Under current policy, um, or to be policy, um, that will change. It's kind of overwhelming, isn't it? Um, and I guess my, my reaction, um, not being someone who is familiar with this population in, in any great detail, um, except just as an informed citizen, is um, just how tragic it is that um, these people who have endured so much and struggled so hard to get to a place where they thought that they could access safety uh, think about, I mean, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So you have basic needs, so for food and water and shelter and stuff, and then is safety. And you can't do any more development if you don't have safety. And um, so they've, they've gone through all this to try to get here and find all kinds of doors closed to them, um, which, you know, it's just, it's worse than any kind of, of expectation or lack, you know, um, getting rid of an expectation that I can imagine because it's, um, this was their hope. And when hope is taken away, what do you have left? Um, yeah. And in many ways that leads us into our, our next question uh, for actually you, uh, Professor Timmons Mitchell, which are, what are the potential long-term consequences that you see for the children who are exposed uh, to the detention camp practices that we've been discussing? Um, do we have it? No, we don't have it. There it is. Okay. So um, before we get into the specific long-term consequences, of which there are many, um, I just wanted to do some framing. And this is, I apologize, because, you know, I'm kind of glossing over 100 years of psychological research and other kinds of research, too. Um, but, but just to sort of frame our discussion, right, theoretically. Um, 
I just I just mentioned about Maslow, you know, dr going back to the frame. But um, in terms of what children themselves need, um, all children, of course, need a secure attachment to a stable caregiver, a parent figure. Um, we go back to to Bowlby's foundational work in the 60s um, that children have to have a secure attachment to a caregiver in order to grow and develop properly. Um, then in the 1990s, Ainsworth and, and a whole bunch of other people talked about how brief separations, even as brief as a week, can negatively impact the relationship um, in, and children's development subsequently. Then we learned starting sort of in the 60s and going forward, um, and many of you are bigger child welfare experts than I, but um, to just summarize that whole literature in a sentence, um, that you know, children raised in institutions you know, who start off with foster care situations and then going to institutions have severe problems with social relations. We see this now, you know, our, our uh, policies have morphed so that we really don't have these large scale um, institutions for caregiving of separated infants and very young children in our culture, but I don't know if any of you have worked, I've worked somewhat extensively with people who've adopted from, say, Russian orphanages, and the, you know, it's just this, this chronic neglect, and so then, you know, you morph forward to putting in all the resources that an adoptive family can muster, and it's still sometimes extremely difficult. Sometimes not, but sometimes extremely difficult because of that early separation and neglect in, in the caregiving and the attachment. Um, and, so um, then we have some other sort of more specific, again, just, just anchor points of research. Um, there's a lovely study in 2009 where uh, Crawford and colleagues showed that separations of a month or more uh, prior to age five have been linked to, among other things, the development of borderline personality disorder in adolescents and adults. And um, Leventhal and Brooks Gunn, to talk about how separation from caregiver for a week or more is negatively associated with reading scores starting at age eight and up. So, you know, we, we may not pick up in individuals the diagnosable mental health disorders, which, you know, in the context of things is probably not the first place to try to intervene anyway, but, um, but the likelihood that some of them could be there, you know, and again, we're talking about these hundreds of children who all have different kinds of presentations, but, you know, the thing that, that I think has traumatized me the most is seeing, and I think they're reenactments largely, but seeing those, those reenactments of those, those toddlers you know, sort of sitting alone at a witness stand with headphones trying to do a translation and no caring adult that they know um, being assigned to help them. And I just, I, I think, I mean, that's the nightmare scenario, you know, from which I'm not sure that an individual recovers. So what I wanted to do was just to frame up a few of, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to um, the uh, sort of some general things and then I'm gonna, uh, kind of overview the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, because that kind of helps us drill down into um, what we might be seeing. So, um, so we know this is responding to trauma, not necessarily the trauma of attachment specifically, but certainly you could group that in there, that most children um, have acute distress, um, and many, um, if they have trusted adults and family, like, um, who was it, was it, Antonio, who had the sister, yeah. Um, you know, if you, can, if you can find a caring family member to reconnect with, maybe that will help mitigate the effects. Um, but a substantial minority develop ongoing um, distress. And the reactions vary. And this is one of the things, I, I don't know if, if you've seen, there have been a couple of, um, again, I think just significant and difficult um, videos to watch, you know, where, where parents say, the child was in fact returned to me um, a youngish child, say three, the child was returned and didn't know who I was. I mean, that's not uncommon at all um, because of this, you know, just fundamental disruption of the attachment that happens at critical periods. So, you know, sometimes um, if we if we had a snippet of that same child now, um, perhaps you know, a few months later, maybe things would have returned. But for some few children, you know, you may never return to to the pre um, traumatic interruption level. And I think that that just, I mean, I don't, I don't know that anybody could ever put a price on something like that. I mean, I think it's just irreplaceable. Um, all right. Yes. And so chronic and pervasive trauma, of course, you know, more and constant is worse than episodic and once, but 
then the question is, how do you experience it? All right, so this is a laundry list, um, which I'm probably not going to just run through word by word because there's everything, but that's really it, right? It's like the adverse effects of childhood experiences can be everything. And it's all these things that you don't even really think of. You know, it, it, of course, we think about mental health disorders. We think about depression. We think about PTSD. We think about suicide. And there's, um, as Glenda yeah, um, was certainly mentioning that, but you know, that's always something in the back of your mind with, with these kinds of scenarios. And it, the other place we know about that is from um, just in our system, you know, juveniles in detention have a, a rate of attempted suicide and suicide that's, you know, quite higher than other populations. Um, but the other things that you may not think about are these incredible health effects, you know, and at the extreme of that, early death, you know, compared with um, matched cohorts. I mean, Kind of everything that you could think. And then all of the, the issues related to sexual health, um, assuming that one can have a life where you can work on sexual health, which many of these violated children can't. So all right. Um, the adverse childhood experiences, I just want to, I'm sure probably everybody knows what they are, but I just want to go through them really quickly because I think that um, if you think about what they are and you match it to what Gabriella has been speaking about in terms of the experience of these children, it's pretty amazing. And look at this chart. Okay, so this chart unfortunately does not have a y-axis that's denoted, but um, what it means is that the five plus, so if you get to five plus um, of the adverse childhood experiences, you're 44% more likely to experience a mental health disorder, again, quite apart from everything else. Um, so uh, here are the things that are on it. Um, the first one is to swear at you, insult you, humiliate you, which, you know, was something that was a hallmark of what you were describing with these children prior to their entry into our system. But I think arguably, um, you know, children in detention, again, even in our juvenile justice system, experience these things hopefully less than they used to. But um, again, the, just the reports from these detention camps would suggest that that's something that probably would be there for most children. All right, so that's one. Um, then the push, grab, slap, or throw something at you possibly in detention, we don't know, uh, possibly someone at least five years older touching your body in a sexual way. You know, have you seen, um, just again, in the newspaper um, or, you know, the news sites, um, at least one guard uh, in the detention facilities has been charged with incidences of sexual assault of children, and probably there are more. Yeah. yeah. Um, Feeling that no one is looking out for you would probably be everybody, so I'm counting that as two because we don't know about the other ones. Um, not enough to eat, dirty clothes, or no one to protect you. Again, we've heard reports of that, so that's three. Parents are separated from the child, so that's the attachment, that's four. Um, mother was hit or threatened either here in the or in the home country, I would think would be everybody, so that's five. And then, you know, the other ones you can add in. Um, if the caregiver had a problem with drinking or using drugs, we don't know. Um, if a household member was depressed or attempted suicide, we don't know. And if somebody went to prison. Um, I guess arguably everybody's in prison, in detention, but um, anyway. So the idea being that um, I don't think we should be surprised if there are significant long-term consequences. I think maybe we should be surprised if there aren't, because um, that's what we would expect. And all right, the prevalence, just quickly. Um, something that was really interesting to me is that nationally, the prevalence of ACEs includes Ohio among the top five states, which I didn't know. Maybe you knew that. Um, because as many as one in children, one in seven children have already experienced three or more of the adverse childhood events. Um, so, yeah. And, and then again, what they're saying is that nationally, um, for Hispanic children, a greater incidence of adverse childhood events, even without the detention. So long-term consequences are to be expected. So if you'd like to comment on this? Well, I would just say that um, for some of the children, I mean, the reports of children being administered psychotropic medications um, appear to be accurate. And in many cases, it's not clear that it was for in the best interest of the child, but rather it may have been in the best interest of um, 
the, the guards or the security personnel because they didn't know how to handle the child. Um, so it's not clear what either the emotional or the neurological effects of that are going to be over the long term. And that has also been challenged in court. That begins to lead us to our final question, and perhaps we could begin again uh, with you, Jane, um, which is, what are the recommended medical therapeutic guidelines to assist the children who have been exposed to this trauma? And how do these current practices in these detention camps align with the guidelines? Sure. So, <laughs> yes, okay. All right. Um, so uh, from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the four R's of a trauma-informed approach. Um, and we didn't talk about these a little bit because I think this may be where the whole thing falls apart, um, if it hadn't already. But um, so the four R's are to realize how trauma can affect families, groups, organizations, and communities, as well as individuals, to recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization. And, Interestingly, as I was looking at this, um, it turns out that the state of Texas, for example, um, has a requirement that everybody dealing with children has to take training that um, emphasizes um, these four R's, but not the people who are running the detention camps. And just the, the division of that is, is so stark as to be completely apparent, I think. Um, all right, the six principles of a trauma-informed approach. Again, I mean, SAMHSA has kind of like served as a clearinghouse to collate these from, you know, all kinds of other resources like the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and um, Zero to Three and, and a bunch of other people, but just kind of putting it together. So safety, first and foremost, and of course, we don't have that in the camps. Uh, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support. Um, I'm thinking for kids, but maybe also for for people who are, are working with them. Um, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historic, and gender issues. And I know you wanted to, to speak to that. But just to, to emphasize, you know, the, I think this is all based on a foundation of respect. You know, it's like we want to help children um, develop appropriately, and, and the way you do that is by respecting them and promoting their autonomy and all those kinds of things, all of which are completely destroyed and antithetical to the approach that's being taken currently. Um, okay. There are also guidelines. Um, these, are, I took these from uh, the APA Presidential Task Force, but they are in all um, of the, the societies. Um, just the recommendations on how mental health professionals can help, um, which, you know, of, of course is way downstream <laughs> from solving the issues of what's actually going on currently. Um, and, and we would need to in, intervene a whole you know, set of, of policy practices, but assuming, bless you, that you got there. Um, so you would want to identify trauma-exposed children and provide culturally appropriate information and support, um, help the children and families connect for follow-up, uh, have special training, have special consultation, and um, obtaining training in developmentally and culturally appropriate evidence-based therapies. And that's, that's a big sentence. Because um, I think um, we sometimes get into silos where we're doing one part of it or another part of it. I, I don't think I could emphasize the developmental part enough. And I know um, that the cultural part has to be emphasized as well. And there are evidence-based pieces for each of them. So kind of trying to, to knit everything all together. Um, and then this is possibly the most important. This is again from the APA, um, the American Psychological Association. Um, what not to do. Um, assume that all children will respond to trauma in the same way. I, what's interesting about this is, again, this assumes that this kind of a slide and this kind of a report assumes that we want to know what not to do. We want to know what to avoid. We want to promote children's well-being. Um, you know, if you're identifying that children could respond to trauma, then presumably you care that they could respond to trauma. But this is, you know, kind of way before that. It's like, um, I'm not sure that the people who are running the detention camps understand the effect that, that they're having on children. For precisely the reason that, that Gabriela said, because children don't often manifest the outward signs of trauma. 
I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had, if you've ever had the experience of sitting with a three-year-old who's experienced extreme trauma, you won't hear about it unless you spend like 20 hours in that, that child's living room. Um, and, and for lots of good reasons, think about why, you know, that all the defenses, you have to, to pull back into a position of safety. Um, okay. Uh, again, pathologizing early distress or reactions, assuming that all trauma-exposed children will have long-term damage. Um, what not to do? Do not create situations in which trauma-exposed children have little choice or control. I mean, that's by definition what we're doing. Um, so I guess um, I'm always somebody, it may not sound like it, but I'm always somebody who, who looks for a kernel of hope. And I think, again, the, the resilience, you know, you can always look for protective factors. They do exist. Um, but just in, in speaking about um, what are the long-term consequences and what are the recommended guidelines, I mean, you know, we, we need to move past that. So I'm very happy to do that at this point in the discussion. Gabrielle, would you like to speak to this? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are, because I, I see um, there are lots of students here, and many of you um, are here because you hope to become social work practitioners, right? Is that a fair assumption? Um, so whether you go the mental health route or um, child welfare in other capacities, what you need to understand is that, uh, like Jane said, I mean, there's the damage has been done, is being done, right? So we're going to be at best dealing with the aftermath. We'll have to do some intervention to restore what can be restored with these children if we get the chance to work with them or their family. So what I would like to emphasize um, for those of you who might be in a position of interacting, trying to help these families, um, is that you, you have to understand that it's true we have fantastic best practices, evidence-based practices th that we can deploy to, to address trauma symptoms. Um, but they will be of, of little help if we don't, do, or don't implement those interventions informed by cultural competence, right? And when we're working with a group like Latinos, we should not assume that they are a monolithic group. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. They're ethnically very diverse. Uh, socioeconomically, there's diversity, and even language-wise, as you heard me talk about dialects that, that people speak, because there's a, a, a significant uh, indigenous population within Latin America, but they're lumped as Latinos, generally. So uh, number one, to remember that you're not dealing with you know, one size fits all, they usually uh, evidence-based practices, as wonderful as they are, fail, you know, oftentimes. Um, particularly when it comes to engaging the family who may be um, less acculturated. The children might, if they're going through the, the school system, you know, they may acculturate faster, but the parents not necessarily. And you need the parent. You need that partnership with the parent. And usually interventions don't work because there's no buy-in. There's no cultural appropriateness there. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, to state the obvious linguistic competence is important. You need to, to be somebody who has good command of the language if they're monolingual. Um, and ideally, you need to have some degree of biculturalism, some understanding, or at least a measure of knowing what you don't know and being humble about it, right? This concept of cultural humility comes into the picture. Um, so be curious, you know, try to learn what do you do in your family, what works, what doesn't for them. Uh, be prepared to engage the extended family. Latinos, as many other groups, have a collectivistic orientation, as it's known, uh, where the, the welfare, the well-being of the group, the family, sometimes the community, is placed above that of the interest of the individual. So what oftentimes happens is that we intervene, we have these mainstream American values, and we try to promote autonomy and self-sufficiency. And you think for yourself, and you make your own choices, and don't worry about everybody else. Well, guess what? That doesn't work. 
not within a collectivistic orientation. It's got to be taken, construed maybe as uh, disrespect towards the parents or the caregivers, and they will not do that. Okay, so you need to understand the intricacies of the culture if you want a great uh, intervention to work. So that's for those of you who might be um, interacting with, uh, with clients. Um, also, remember that in our work with children, for instance, we don't talk a lot with children. We do a lot. We use materials, we use play um, activities because we're trying to match their developmental level, right? Many of these kids come from backgrounds that are extremely deprived, right? Materially, there's not much that they have that they own. Actually, there's very little. So sometimes we assume that, well, their children, they will like to do things such as drawing. They might have not seen coloring pencils ever in their lives, okay? If, if we're dealing with an individual who is relatively new to this culture, keep those things in mind because we assume that the basics are there, but not necessarily. So learn what is it that these kids do when they can afford the luxury of playing or having some downtime. Because these kids that I uh, interacted with, uh, they work. Yes, they go to school, that, that may be their downtime, but they basically work. They're not watching TV, it's no such a thing. They're not playing, right? There's no toys. So what materials you use to engage them may need to be tweaked to fit what they can relate to. So keep that in mind. Um, depending on their acculturation level. So these are very basic things that I wanted to, to mention. Mm -hmm. um, not speaking specifically to the psychological effects, but um, the Flores Settlement established a standard for how children can be detained or not. And so what it said is that children have to be released from custody without delay. And there is a very small um, time frame, a very small leeway for the government in times of great influx. But what it said specifically is, is that when a child couldn't be released because they were of um, they were a flight risk because they were of a danger to they were a danger to themselves or to others or because they could be trafficked, they had to be held in the least restrictive environment. And generally, it had to be a non-secure facility that was licensed by a child welfare entity. And there were standards for how the children should be treated within that entity. So what is happening now is, um, is completely in contravention of that settlement agreement. Um, so there are standards. They were developed in conjunction with expert, with child welfare experts and child development experts. So for folks who are interested in um, any form of activism, the proposed regulations, which are still in the proposal stage, um, I believe they're still open for notice and comment, um, they would override this settlement agreement and negate it. And so it is critically important that people um, provide comments in response to those proposed regulations and that they contact their, represent, their representatives to our federal, uh, to Congress, not to state um, legislat legislators, and let them know where they stand on this position. Um, it's, it's an election year. It's an important year. Um, I think the vast majority of people are not aware that this issue is out there. Um, so it becomes really important that our representatives hear our voices on that. Thank you. Any final thoughts uh, before I transition to questions from the audience? Okay, do we have that microphone somewhere? <coughs> Could you please talk some more about these regulations? I tend to think they're not too good, right? They're not, in my opinion, they're not too good. It probably depends on one's perspective. Um, but what they would do is to require the, that if uh, children enter with their parents, or without their parents, but their parents are undocumented, it would require that they be detained with their parents 
in a detention facility for the duration of the, um, for the pendency of the, the, the parent's asylum application or whatever kind of relief they may be applying for from removal. So if you follow, for instance, um, the news, there are tremendous backlogs now in the immigration courts with um, asylum claims, with all kinds of cases. And the Department of Justice, let me explain a little bit about the structure of the immigration court. So unlike um, district court, unlike state court, unlike our federal court system, these are, this is not an independent independent judiciary. This is an administrative court that sits under the Department of Justice. So what Jeff Sessions has done now is to impose quotas on the immigration judges, which has never happened before, saying essentially you have 15 minutes to decide somebody's life. Um, so, and the, the ostensible purpose of it is to get rid of this backlog of cases which runs years, four, five, six years in some cases, in some districts. So when these regulations are requiring that children be detained with their parents, essentially that's saying that a child has to be in detention for that amount of time. And the detention facilities that um, right now um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement is utilizing do not meet the standards of the Flores Settlement. Um, which require not detention, but the least restrictive alternative. So not only does it put kids in detention who shouldn't be in detention, but it's confining them for these long periods of time and also reducing the likelihood that even a successful asylum claim could be successful because of these quotas that are being imposed on the judges now. Can you speak briefly to who is funding the detention facilities that you've just described? The corporations or the companies that are actually running these? Do you know more about that? So I don't, I don't have specifics. Um, many of them are now private contractors that the government has contracted to. Um, there have been allegations in the past, some of them found to be valid of maltreatment of detainees, whether they're children or adults. Um, individuals have been subjected to, and, and this is not specific to the current situation, but in general, um, individuals have been subjected to, to body cavity searches without justification, to strip searches without justification, um, to abuse. Um, so it has become, particularly now, with the influx of individuals, um, that are in detention, it has become a profit-making venture for these companies. I might like to speak briefly to that. So I think, Dana, you pointed out something that's really important, which is the growth of these for-profit detention centers, which they form in the early 1980s. That's when the corporation, what is it called? A Corrections Corporation of America is formed, I believe, in 83. It's now Core Civic. And let's say before their formation, or even before the mid-1990s, there was something like, before 1995, about 8,500 immigrants are held per day across the United States. With the growth of these after the mid-1990s, that number doubles to about 16,000 per day, and now it's something like 34 to 40,000 immigrants that are being held per day across these centers. And the numbers, when you look at them all in their total, are just incredible. And the abuses that are taking place that San is pointing to are incredible. The ACLU has a report out on one of these, on a cluster of these facilities that they examined, and the things that they found were extremely disgusting and inhumane because these detention centers are not even subject to the same regulations that we apply to county jails, to prisons, to federal prisons. They are for-profit private entities. And so even getting at what's happening within them is difficult for these lawyers to, to access. So it's really horrific in the way the rise of these for-profit detention centers are profiting from the immiseration of the people we're talking about today. I have a couple questions about the uh, immigration courts. One, uh, how many, what percentage of asylum seekers are represented by legal counsel? And two, can the judgments be overturned? 
So um, I, I can't give you the percentage because I, I simply don't know. Um, I can say that many asylum seekers are not represented by attorneys. Um, so if we look at the current situation, I had talked about the form that the Border Patrol officers um, were requiring parents to sign. Until there was a lawsuit, they didn't add a third line that allowed someone to check off that they wanted to speak with an attorney. So that gives you some sense of what's happening. Um, I think in general, um, you know, cases are much easier, much faster to be processed through immigration court when someone is not represented by a lawyer um, who asks for additional time, who presents more evidence. It becomes a lengthier process. Assuming that someone is denied asylum, um, they have the right to appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals, um, which does not hear the case um, de novo. It, they don't look at it from the very beginning, they look at whatever is on the record, which makes it that much more important that if someone, particularly someone who has a valid claim, that they be represented so that whatever evidence there is to substantiate their claim is on the record, because the BIA will not entertain new evidence. It has to be there already. There are other processes as well, but that's the basic appeals process. I, I understand that there's a man in uh, from Haiti in the, the Chardon or Lake or Geauga County facility who has been granted asylum, but it's been taken away. It, do you know anything about that? I don't know about that case specifically. There are circumstances in which asylum can be um, taken away. So for instance, um, a, someone who... Someone who is granted asylum who has not yet applied or received permanent residence, what's euphemistically known as a green card, although it hasn't been green for probably at least 80 years, um, if they, if the situation in their home country changes, because the basis for asylum is the persecution, and the or the fear of persecution, so if the situation in their home country changes asylum can be terminated. Um, there may be other circumstances in his particular case as well, but I don't know enough to comment on it. Um, could you sp any of you speak to any efforts that are happening locally, speaking of that question, any collaborations between child welfare and immigration services to provide supports for kids um, who've been removed from their families or you know, trying to recruit host families to work with kids or, you know, to what extent are kids actually detained in our state that are, were picked up at the border? Any kind of local, local um, implications or opportunities? I, I can't speak specifically to that. I can say that one of the problems is still that um, the government doesn't know where all of the children are, um, and that is a problem. Yeah, I, I don't know too much about more systemic, you know, collaborations. I do know that there are some initiatives probably spearheaded by individuals who have put together lists of people, I'm speaking about the mental health field in particular, who are willing to pro bono help in any way they can, you know, with their services. So that much I know, and I could put anybody who's interested in being part of those networks in touch with that. Yeah, you could provide that to Schubert so that we could actually yeah. that, make that sure. available to people. Mm -hmm. just to that. Yeah, I can do that. And speaking to that great question, I mean, we've been in many ways discussing the family separations that have been going on along that border in a very sensational way. But as we all know, every time you deport or detain an immigrant, you are separating them from their family. And Ohio now is the site of the two now largest workplace raids that have occurred across the country under the current administration. And during those raids, the group that has just been phenomenal is a group called OLA, which is a grassroots Latino advocacy organization that has been just doing nonstop work to help those people who have been separated from their children. And that included something like, I don't know what the number was, over 100 or 80 some children who had to be placed in different people's homes. And these are all sort of people who are volunteering and who are supporting OLA and who are doing the best that they can when these types of attacks, I would call them, happen on immigrant communities. 
So Ola is a wonderful resource. And actually, we have some people, I just saw some people in the back who are actually working on the case of Ansley Damis, who is the Haitian immigrant that was mentioned uh, a little while ago in that question. And what's I, the only reason I'm bringing that up again is because there are people who are doing very important things and very humanitarian things. Uh, I know we don't see that in the mainstream media, that people actually care and, about people and do wonderful things. And some of those people are in the back. And what I just want to quickly say about that, and maybe it'll, I don't know if Sana would want to comment, or, or comment on this or not, is his case is unique in the sense that an immigration judge ruled in his favor, granting him asylum. Or I should say it's not unique, but it's exemplary of what's happening here. An immigration judge ruled in his favor, granting him asylum, and ICE appealed that ruling. And then his case went before the same judge who looked at the new evidence and once again ruled in his favor. And then ICE appealed that ruling, I believe, again. I don't know if now it's three times or two times. Is it three times? Three times. So, you know, there's a, I mean, the judge is ruling in his favor, and it's ICE that's appealing those rulings. And he remains in, I believe it's Geauga County Jail, uh, which speaks to the relationship. I mean, detention centers are supposed to be, in the legal sense, non-punitive. They're supposed to be holding you before you are tried, et cetera. But yet there's this relationship now between all of these jails and what's taking place here. So he's in jail, and he's been in jail this entire time, even though a judge has been ruling in his interests. Um, and I don't know how common that is for ICE to be challenging the rulings, but I just found that to be quite, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's alarming, right? That they're, it's like they have their own agenda here that they're exercising. Yeah, it's not unusual. It's really not unusual. Is there a list someplace that we can get if you're interested or just, you know, kind of call these organizations or these organizations need donations? I sit here and listen to this and go, other than registering to vote, and I hope everybody in this room has done that and you're all ready to go out in November, mm -hmm. and writing your Congress people, which many of us probably do at least every week, about something. What else can be done or is it listed someplace that we can really dig into this? Are there readings we can do? And then just a quick second question. Um, when you uh, mentioned the prevalence of ACEs, uh, it was Arizona, Arkansas, Montana, New Mexico, and Ohio. What is it, I mean, I'm, you know, wow. Um, what is it about Ohio and why is that happening? But I want to go back to the list. Okay, two questions, thanks. Um, so, what I would recommend if you, um, see Kate, if you see families or children who have been in these situations, who are in these detention situations, there is a legal organization that um, may be able to put you in touch with either some pro bono attorneys or they may be actually preparing um, litigation on a particular issue and knowing about that particular situation may be helpful. Um, that is the American Immigration Lawyers Association. It's AILA.org. Um, and they have an, an, a related arm. They don't do the litigation themselves. There is a foundation associated with it that they can refer you to. Um, that tries to collect these kinds of stories um, so that they can move forward with the litigation and challenge some of the practices, including responding to these proposed regulations. I'm going to address the first part, or would you like to address the second part? Okay. okay. The second I, part? I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, if I had to guess, um, I would think, you know, sort of the, the overall incidence of, of poverty and then. Um, Maybe the pockets of the opioid crisis and um, economic downturn and how that may interact with abuse and neglect, I'm not really sure. I don't know the years um, for what was cited, and that might have um, something to do with it. Other people can speculate as, as you'd like. In relation to that list, I'll help put together that list for the Social Justice Institute, which we'll display on, on our webpage. Uh, for that great suggestion. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, there's OLA, which I think does wonderful work. And I think I, that's H-O-L-A. It's, okay. it's on this yellow sheet too, right here, OLA, so you can get to that right And speaking about two things that some of you in the audience may want to consider doing. So one is, and I know a student just left who's actually the, uh, one of the leaders of a student group called La Alianza. So La Alianza and I are working together to create a fundraiser for OLA on October 30th. And we're creating this fundraiser 
to help them with the amount, the incredible amount of money that they've spent in bailing people out of these detention centers since these two massive workplace raids occurred. So that's one thing that we decided to do as an initiative, but I think it would be pretty amazing if some of you who have connections to other institutions and other networks decided to do even a local, a local fundraiser for OLA. Because if you were to do that, you're gonna get at then the complex ideological discussions that I think we really need to get at in our country about what is happening, not just to these children, but immigrants in general, and all of us, all of us in general, that is what is happening here. I think we need to have these kinds of conversations. We need to have conversations about what we see taking place. And I just wanna add one point about what I think that conversation could include, which is a conversation about this concept of sanctuary. So there's three churches now in Northeast Ohio that have now declared themselves sanctuary spaces. But I actually think we need to broaden out maybe and think about how we wanna define sanctuary. So there's one way of thinking about it, which is you know we house an undocumented person who's in the process of being de deported, expelled, and we, you know, they have to have facilities, they have to have a kitchen, et cetera. Another way of thinking about it is, will the institutions that we have connections to participate in the expulsion of these people? That is, will it facilitate this dehumanization of human beings as aliens? Will, will our institutions, can we talk to them about this? That is, is your church, is the hospital you go to that you have connections to, is the school that you go to that, has, that you have connections to? What about broadening this out so that every church is a sanctuary church or conceives of itself that way, even if it's not at this moment housing an undocumented immigrant? What about every university? Is our university a sanctuary university? Shouldn't all universities be sanctuaries? What about community centers? What about, I mean, what about having this discussion about what it means to be a sanctuary and having a discussion about what's taking place here uh, against immigrants across our country? I think those would be very valuable discussions. Thanks so much. You know, the, we we meant and we had when we planned this uh, panel, we meant to have uh, plenty of time to discuss next steps, to think of actionable things we could do because past the frustration, there's a, a need to do something about it. And, and this is, has taken place because of your questions and that's wonderful. And I wanted to add something. Um, yes, it's true that the situation of the children currently in these camps is dire, and we will need experts and, and, and good-hearted experts and, and people to take care of them. We don't know what's going to happen to them, but we can do things to prevent this and in the social, to prevent you know future kids from going <coughs> through this situation. I have read that the children out of Guatemala and other places that are ridden with violence, the rate of children incoming to, to trying to cross the border has not decreased. What has happened is that now it's so much harder to deal with, with uh, each child that the children are held longer in these detention camps. And so now there's this huge, um, you know, unexpected uh, number of kids needing processes. And that's why the, these things are <laughs> the 15 minute trial, uh, uh, kind of a crazy things that we're seeing are taking place. So. Um, I wanted also in the introduction to mention that also um, co-sponsored by Social Justice, by Dr. Dana Prince and others at the Mendel School is the, the exhibit of uh, Queer Love Then and Now. And as I was trying to get ready for this, um, I, I happened to look at the AIDS epidemic a presentation that spoke about detention camps, similar to detention camps for people that were first diagnosed with AIDS. This has happened and it continues to happen. And unless you know, we provide better information for people, maybe through OLA, maybe through other websites, we provide information that humanizes uh, the situation and uh, try to get to the institutions to prevent this, um, I think you know, we, we're, we're going to um, have history repeat itself over and over again. So, so I do, yeah, I, like I've, I've heard from all of you, there, there's hope and there's things that we can do. Information is the first step, but um, I, I'm, I'm, thank you uh, 
I, this is not meant to to finish the conversation. I just want to pass it back and, and say that we are going to put that information in through OLA and thanks to the Social Justice Institute as well so that we can continue to think about better ways to respond to this. Um, it's probably true, and maybe there's some reaction, if the inhumane treatment of people who are vulnerable and who are not citizens really bodes ill for the future of how citizens will be treated, and if um, traumatic separation of parents from children has ever could be defined as torture. Yeah. Would one of you like to speak to that, or would you like me to speak to that? I'm not qualified to speak to that. Yeah, I, I don't have the legal background to speak to that. Um, Sana just left. Okay, really? <laughs> um, certainly feels like it. Well, I think it really depends on how we see what's happening. And so I don't think my perspective necessarily contradicts maybe what has been said. But I would argue it's distinct and it parallels maybe what's been said. And actually, I've been asked quite a bit to address this question of childhood separation because it, at present, is so locked to the current presidential administration mm -hmm. as though it's a product of that administration's policies, which in some sense is true, but in some sense it is not. And to, from my understanding of what's taking place, it's a very complicated process, which I seek to address in a video on the YouTube channel of the Social Justice Institute. But I could give you a preview right now, which would say that much of what we see taking place here is a consequence of what I would call the growth of what sociologists and others call the carceral state. That is, with the explosion of institutions that can incarcerate people, you are separating more and more and more people from their families. And that is paralleled in the working class and racialized minorities communities of the United States who also deal with a very draconian and vicious family separation situation tied to the way the courts treat them and the way they're incarcerated. And so I see what's taking place here against Mexicans quite connected to what's taking place to many oppressed peoples across our, our country. And I think that connection needs to be emphasized. Okay. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>